Spinal nerves form lateral to the intervertebral foramen. Where exactly is the intervertebral foramen? Well, it's an opening that we find along the length of the vertebral column. Now, we have two intervertebral foramina. Don't forget that the plural version of foramen is foramina. So we have one intervertebral foramen on the right side and another one on the left side. Why is that? Well, it's because we have a pair of spinal nerves for every spinal cord segment. So if we look at this illustration that I made to the left, we know that each spinal cord segment, and for this particular diagram, I used L1 spinal cord segment. So when the dorsal root, which I'll highlight in blue, unites with the ventral root, this time I'll highlight it in green, unite, then we form the spinal nerve. We also find one on the right side. So once again, I'll highlight the dorsal root and the ventral root. So they unite to give us again the spinal nerves. So we have a pair for every single spinal cord segment. And of course, the numbering system is based upon where they emerged from the particular spinal cord segment. So if this is L1 spinal cord segment, then these would be the pair of L1 spinal nerves. Anyway, these spinal nerves will form lateral to the intervertebral foramina. So what I've done here is I've encircled this area to indicate the openings, the intervertebral foramina, where we're going to find these spinal nerves. Now you're going to see that there will be extensive branching with these spinal nerves as they form pathways to our body organs and the tissues. Eventually, we get to the very ends of these spinal nerves that we refer to as the peripheral nerves. So once again, these are the terminal ends of the spinal nerve. Now, when we carefully look at these spinal nerves, we see that they will contain both sensory, which is also referred to as afferent fibers, which basically means input to the central nervous system. So I've indicated this red arrow as the sensory input afferent. In addition, we also find motor output, also referred to as efferent, that will leave the spinal cord, in other words, output from the central nervous system, which the spinal cord is part of, and they will eventually, through these peripheral nerves, arrive at the effectors. So this would be motor output efferent. So once again, these spinal nerves contain both of these types of fibers. Therefore, we can refer to these spinal nerves as mixed nerves. Well, one of the branches that we begin to see with the spinal nerve is when they form what's called the rami communicantes and commonly known as the communicating branches. So this rami communicantes will branch to give us the white ramus communicans, or we could just simply say white ramus, and the gray ramus communicans, which we can just simply say gray ramus. Incidentally, ramus is the singular form, while rami is the plural form. So let's look at this white ramus communicans, or simply white ramus. Please remember that these white rami will only be found at spinal cord segments T1 to L2. So if we, let's say, look at spinal cord segment L3, will we find these white rami? No. Well, what if we look at, let's say, C4 spinal cord segment? Would we expect to find white rami? No, because once again, this white ramus communicans or white ramus is only found between spinal cord segments T1 to L2. So please remember that. Now we also find additional branches, which we refer to as the dorsal or posterior ramus, the ventral or anterior ramus. So the dorsal or posterior ramus, as far as the diameter is concerned, will be smaller in diameter versus the anterior or ventral ramus, which will have a larger diameter. So it turns out 
that the dorsal or posterior ramus will innervate or serve or supply or control regions found in the posterior side of our body. So our deep muscles of the back would be an example. Skin on our back. Structures of the upper and lower limbs that are found posteriorly and as well as the posterior region of the trunk. While the ventral or anterior ramus will innervate, supply, serve, control the anterior and lateral regions of the body. So would that mean muscles that we find on the anterior and lateral regions of the body? Yes. What about the skin? Same thing, anterior and lateral regions. The structures of the upper limb and lower limb as well as the trunk of the body, as long as it's the anterior and lateral regions. Now there's a tiny little branch called the meningeal branch that also branches off the spinal nerve. Now this will re-enter the vertebral cavity through this opening, the intervertebral foramen. Why is that? Well, it's because it's going to supply the vertebrae, the vertebral ligaments, as well as the blood vessels of the spinal cord and the spinal meninges. So I will point this meningeal branch when we look at the next slide. Now, as far as further discussion of the meningeal branch, this is all that we're going to cover. So one of the files that you have under modules for this particular chapter is one that's titled Print Diagram, One Spinal Cord Segment. Furthermore, it's asking you to print at least five copies of this diagram. So if you have one of those copies, go ahead and take it out. If you haven't had a chance to print at least five copies of that diagram or that file, please make sure you do so. So I would suggest that you pause the video print five copies. That way, as we proceed with the discussion, you will have these copies ready. Now, the spinal cord segment that we are going to be focusing on specifically is between T1 to L2. The first thing we want to do is identify what is dorsal, also called posterior, ventral, which is also called anterior. So one of the landmarks that you should be looking for is the anterior median fissure. So a fissure is a deeper groove. You can't miss the fissure. So once you've located this fissure, then you know you're looking ventrally or anteriorly. I hope it's clear that the fissure specifically is called the anterior median fissure. Now, if we look at the dorsal or posterior side, we have the posterior median sulcus. Why is it called a sulcus? Because the groove isn't as deep. It's not as profound. All right, so let's begin by looking at what's referred to as the dorsal root. So this dorsal root, which I'll highlight in green, is obviously found on the posterior side of the spinal cord. Now, along the length of this dorsal root is a structure called the dorsal root ganglion. So I hope it's obvious that we're looking at this bulge-like structure called the dorsal root ganglion. Now, if we look anteriorly, we have the ventral root. So this entire area that I am highlighting in pink is the ventral root. Notice there is no ventral root ganglion. So the union of the dorsal root and the ventral root will give us the spinal nerve. So I hope you've noticed that there's branching off of the spinal nerve. Let's look at one of those branches. The first branch is the dorsal ramus. Now take note, I did not illustrate the diameter of the dorsal ramus being smaller than the diameter of the ventral ramus. So speaking of the ventral ramus, here it is. So this entire area right here is the ventral ramus. So what else do we have? Well, we have the rami communicantes, one of which is the white ramus communicans, or just simply the white ramus. So I'll highlight the area where we find the white ramus. Then of course, we have the gray ramus communicans. This time, I'll highlight it in gray. So here is the gray ramus communicans, or simply gray ramus. Now, going back to the white 
ramus. Please remember, as I said in the last slide, this is only found between spinal cord segment T1 to L2. We do not find it inferior to L2 spinal cord segment, nor do we find it superior to T1 spinal cord segment. We also have a structure called the sympathetic chain ganglion. So this is another bulge-like structure. And what exactly do we find in the sympathetic chain ganglion? We'll discuss that actually in the next chapter. Then we have what's called the sympathetic chain. So this area that I'm highlighting in this light gray is the sympathetic chain. So there's this structure that I am going to color in with this orange highlighter. And this offshoot, which I'm calling it as an offshoot for now, we're going to actually identify it with the correct term. But that will not be till the next chapter. So for now, I'm just referring it to offshoot. The last branch off of the spinal nerve is this meningeal branch. So I briefly mentioned the meningeal branch in the last slide. So this is going to go back into the intervertebral foramen. Why? Because once again, it's going to supply the spinal meninges. It's going to supply the blood vessels of the spinal cord. It's going to supply the vertebrae and as well as the vertebral ligaments. Before we move on to the next slide, I want to look at the gray horns, specifically the part that's highlighted in yellow and the part that I labeled lateral gray horn. So this lateral gray horn, just like the white ramus, is only found between spinal cord segments T1 to L2. So it's important to remember that the white ramus, T1 to L2, the lateral gray horn, T1 to L2. So what I'd like you now to do is to go ahead and take out the second copy of the one spinal cord segment diagram. So what we're now going to discuss is the somatic afferent or somatic sensory division of the peripheral nervous system. So I've inserted this particular image. In fact, you have a copy of this in the nervous tissue presentation or lecture notes. Once again, we're looking at the somatic sensory, also called somatic afferent. So this is input signals that's being sent to the central nervous system. The somatic sensory or the somatic afferent will have sensory receptors that are coming from skin, skeletal muscle, and joints. Well, what if it's sensory input that's coming from other parts of the body? What if it's not from skin, skeletal muscle, and joints? Well, then they're going to fall under the visceral afferent or visceral sensory, something that we're actually going to discuss later. One of the things that we discussed earlier is the different types of neurons. So structurally speaking, a sensory neuron is a unipolar neuron. So this is something that I illustrated up on the top. Now, functionally speaking, this is, of course, a sensory neuron. So please understand the difference between structurally versus functionally. So if you don't remember the difference, please make sure you go back and look at your lecture notes. So the dendrites, which I've colored in with my orange highlighter, are the sensory receptors. So these dendrites are the sensory receptors that we find in the skin, skeletal muscle, and joints. Therefore, we can all agree, I hope, that this is a somatic sensory neuron. So if we follow the direction of the action potential, it's going to travel in this direction. Where is it heading to? Well, it's heading to the central nervous system. Remember, this is input. This is sensory. This is afferent. So what we're now going to do is illustrate somatic sensory neurons as it's sending signals to the central nervous system and, of course, the spinal cord being part of it. So let's say someone pokes you on your back. So you're feeling that because of your somatic sensory neurons. Now remember, this is from the skin of your back, right? So if someone pokes you on your back, I hope that's obvious that you're poking the skin. How are we going to illustrate this? Well, let's see. Remember, this is coming from the skin of your back. So follow along with me and illustrate this out as I'm trying 
to hold my hand as steady as possible. So if someone pokes you on your back, you are feeling this because of the somatic sensory neuron. So what I've illustrated is a unipolar neuron. So where are the dendrites? Well, the dendrites are right over here. So these are the dendrites. So let's now follow the path of the action potential. How is the action potential going to travel? Well, it's going to travel in this direction. Why is it traveling in this direction? Because it's sending signals, input signals, to the central nervous system. Well, let's say someone now pokes you on your abdomen. Okay, now I think everyone can agree that's skin on the anterior region of the body. So how are we going to illustrate the somatic sensory neuron now? Well, let's see. So once again, I'm trying to hold my hand as steady as possible. And what I'm illustrating is a unipolar neuron, sensory neuron. So we'll complete the picture by including the receptors. So these are the dendrites, which are found on the skin. So once again, let's now illustrate out the direction of the action potential. So it should be traveling in this direction. Why? Because this is input. This is afferent. This is sensory input to the central nervous system. So I hope this is obvious that what we have right here along the dorsal root is a dorsal root ganglion. So what this dorsal root ganglion represents is the cluster of cell bodies from the sensory neurons. And if you recall, the cell body is the part of the neuron where we find the nucleus. We can also refer to the cell body as the soma.